Okay, it says it's live, so and it's recording. I'm going to just pause that because we don't really want to record us sitting here. Complex physical disability symptoms. And that's sort of the perspective we're going to work through today with this talk as we consider how we can better predict and prescribe physical health needs for people with chronic neurological disability. But it's important to explain the RHN a little bit before we go along so you know the position I'm coming from. Uh, we are an independent charity. We have a, a, a level one NHS England commissioned uh, rehab, uh, two wards, 45 patients. But we also um, have a very, very large residential care service. <clears throat> We have about 122 nursing home beds across six wards. At last count, about 70 of those people uh, lived with us in a, a prolonged disorder of consciousness. And we also have our specialist services, so Huntington's unit, community ventilator unit, um, a, a unit for people with behaviour which, which challenges. So we're very diverse and slightly separate from the NHS. But to be really explicit, we support people with very profound, um, severe and often irreversible disability with lifelong care needs. To, so to put that in some numbers, only 48 people. This, I think this was a snapshot done in about 2017, 2018. But at that time, of 220 people under our roof, only 48 were able to consent to their placement. We had 180 people with a feeding tube. 217 of the 220 relied on a wheelchair to get around and 53 people with a tracheostomy. So that's the position that I'm coming from um, clinically and, and in our experience that we're going to share a little bit of today. And just to define the population we're speaking of more discreetly, I'll be talking purely about those with severe physical disability and really focusing in on those who have significant levels of dependence. So we think of people who need help from two or more others for all activities of daily living, which can be considered as an MPD or Northwick Park dependency score of 25 or more. And really importantly, they have a limited prognosis for physical recovery. So the condition they are in is, is somewhat permanent. And within that condition, a lot of our patients and a lot of our residents um, have reduced decision making capacity. So we need to consider what best interest and proxy decision making looks like for them as we go along in their clinical journey as well. I brought this up because it's an excellent resource for those who may be less familiar with what a best interest decision make a best interest decision is and how it's constructed by Derek Wade. Um, the primary thing I'd like you all to take home today is that it is the decision that if that person could tell us that they would make it's not always the safest decision. It's not always the most evidence-based decision, but it is what you think they would tell you and in line with least restrictive practices. So we are um, legally bound to consult widely, talk to many many people within that person's family and within their community and make sure we, we do our best possible job to understand what they would want and integrate that into our decision making. And when we look at this population in numbers, we, there was an estimation that there's about 350,000 adults in the UK who require this high level of care following neurological injury. It's estimated that their rehab, their inpatient rehab, is around £70,000. And that even at discharge, their care needs are around £1,300 a week after discharge from rehab. And as we get better and better, the life expectancy for these conditions is growing. So in 2019, Lintona Stokes estimated life expectancy at eight to 12 years. Um, with our now facility, we have people living with us in disorders of consciousness for 20, 25 years following their brain injury. So these people will live for a long time. And one of the things we're going to talk to a little bit today is about changing our thinking a little bit, that those who live with this level of profound and irreversible neurological injury probably have something that more resembles a chronic and progressive physical condition. And their condition has a lot of um, homogeneity. There's a lot of things that are common within, within this population, which if we start to dig down, it makes it easier to predict what they might need from us and the challenges they might face. Um, they're profoundly immobile. The population we're speaking to won't, won't, won't stand, walk, roll, sit, any of those sorts of things. They will most likely be dependent on others for all movements throughout their life. And that irreversibility comes with chronicity. And within that condition, they're probably going to remain reliant on others to identify, to predict um, and advocate for their care needs throughout their lifetime. And if we don't 
develop a framework to see ahead as to what they will need. It's really hard to preempt. But one of the key messages here is that their condition is not static. It changes over their lifetime. And using the old WHO framework, we can start to consider their condition as a, a dynamic, potentially progressive condition where those continual small impairment level changes can influence activity and participation. And that disability is further influenced by intrinsic, so within the person factors, but also extrinsic, so environment treatment and what sort of preventative strategies we create. So if we start thinking about this as a lifelong approach to stabilise disability, we have to consider the, the number of years that these people live in this condition and, and age and time are, are not great bedfellows to disability. Um, age compounds disability. People, you know, physiologically age quicker with greater muscle breakdown, problems in lipid and cholesterol management with cardiac consequences. The physical sequela are, are the chronic complications of their condition. So there's a constellation of impairments that we're going to talk about that if we don't do anything about, they will snowball into increasing disability. And the only thing that can help to offset that is sort of continual and ongoing expert treatment, which aims to predict and preempt um, or quickly recognize deterioration and provide treatment or prevention. So the things that really commonly happen that we're going to have a bit more of a chat about today are changes in muscle and connective tissue, secondary disuse and weakness, sarcopenia, spasticity, joint and postural deformity, soft tissue injuries and pain, which is often overlooked. And the take home message is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So these things, they, they combine together and snowball into bigger problems for the person. So starting to just dive into contracture a little bit, just a reminder that contracture is that joint range of motion limitation, and it's caused by a multiplicity of structures. So muscle, articular, connective tissue, all working together to progress towards permanent joint deformity. So we need to look at all components of contracture to be effective in our management. This is a great article by Sticko that looks at the muscle changes that occur in brain injury, really proposing that after brain injury, connective tissue alterations begin in a vicious circle composed of three phases. So there's an increase in, in the viscosity of the extracellular matrix, so the layer of um, sort of like goo and slidiness that sits around our muscle fibres. And when that goo is less slidy, we get active muscle stiffness within, within the muscle. And that contributes to some subclinical contractures, which exacerbate those neurally mediated reflex mechanisms. So the muscle spindle starts to get a bit more irritable, a bit more easily activated. And then we start to see collagen deposit within muscle and an increase in connective muscle, increase of connective tissues with an increase in, in, in passive muscle stiffness. So we can see shortly after brain injury with paresis that really, really quickly muscle atrophy occurs with reduced muscle pination angles. So force generation capability and extensibility begin to be lost. We see passive muscle stiffness occurring through changes in sarcomere length and the number of sarcomeres in series and changes in muscle fascicle length and fascicular stiffness. And contributing to the extracellular matrix and fibrosis is this the stiffening of the extracellular matrix and connective tissue lay down across the tissues. Connective tissue is really key. And we don't think about it enough. There's several connective tissue layers, but if we focus on the tertiary paramyceum, um, it connects muscle to neural venous and lymphatic tissues and enters and crosses muscle transversely. We often think about um, the paramyceum is being sort of contingent with muscle, continuous with muscle, and it is, and it transmits muscle force to bone that way. But there's also connective tissue that crosses through muscle fibers. Um, and that's when we get this thing called epimuscular force transmission, where these extra muscular connections um, contribute to both the, the passive stiffness we feel when we stretch muscle through cross bridging, but also can alter the strength generation of muscle through being tighter in different places. And so we see here this top side is a normal tertiary paramyceum P3, and this is the uh, tertiary paramyceum of the FCU in a 16 year old with cerebral palsy. And you can just see how much thicker that is in people who have suffered some sort of brain injury. And looking at that in a little bit more detail, you can see the same same young lad here, 
his FC, his FCU has been distally tenotomized. And all of this yellow stuff is that connective tissue crossing extra muscularly, so tethering the FCU to the surrounding neurovascular and muscular structures. And even more specifically, creating periods of um, creating areas of in, uh, unequal strain in the sarcomere themselves to affect both strength generation and extensibility. Joint changes happen really, really early and often underlooked and under considered. So this is a rat study, but we don't really have the ability to do the same things in humans. Um, so these guys took uh, 40 rat knees or 40 rats and they externally, internally fixated 40 knees of rats. And at various points, they, um, well, they killed the rats and they examined their knees separately at points up until 30 weeks. They surgically assessed the knees to have a look at how much of the, the, the loss of range or the joint deformity was contributed from the muscle myogenically or arthrogenically from the joint. And you can see here this uh, grey section at the bottom is the, the amount of joint contribution and the black section is that contributed by muscle shortening. So at two weeks, 60% of that loss of range was muscle. So that's happening quickly. But by the time we go on, the muscular component is fading and the arthrogenic or joint deformity takes over and is approximately 98% um, of the passive range of motion loss. So really big contribution from joint in the longer term. And when we think about treatment here, yes, muscle, we need to focus on that. But if we don't want to end up here at 30 weeks, we need to check, switch and include um, a focus on joint range of motion into our treatment and our prevention. So when we look at the, the problem the other way around and think what are the risk factors for developing contraction, when you look at the evidence, there's some really four really clear factors that stand out for those who are at risk of developing muscle and joint contraction. Important to remember that contracture is not a feature that is um, unique to people with brain injuries. You'll see contracture in the elderly population, those without brain injuries. It's a, it's a myogenic feature of muscle, meaning that's something that the muscle and the joint can do on its own without any of the interference from an upper motor neuron lesion. But there are these four factors that seem to clearly um, put someone at risk of increasing contractures that we're going to talk about from the evidence. And it makes sense as soon as you say them out loud. Uh, muscle weakness, spasticity, immobility, and illness severity, which cumulatively contribute to a muscle or a joint being held in a shortened position for a prolonged period, leading to that irreversible loss of joint and muscle range of motion. So we're going to look at them all in a little bit more detail. So muscle weakness has been associated with disuse, uh, joint and then secondary joint immobilization from disuse, you can't move your joint, it's going to be in the same position for a long period of time. But also changes in the muscle uh, biomechanics itself, including atrophy, loss of muscle pinnation angles. And pinnation angles don't just contribute to strength. When a pinnation angle uh, extends across a joint, it enables a muscle to be more extensible as well. And the contribution of weakness to spasticity is quite significant. Um, there was a study by Ada in 2006, and they found that in the first four months following stroke, spasticity was the biggest contract contribution to contracture development. But beyond four months, it really came down to muscle weakness um, and low arm function. Mahotra again concluded that risk contractures were more likely to develop in patients who did not recover useful arm function and that loss of function, not spasticity, was the primary factor in contracture development. And Pandy in 2003 concluding that those with poor functional upper limb recovery were most at risk of contracture development. And QA 2012 contracture was most common in those with severe stroke and reduced upper limb function. So the correlation between weakness and non-use really strong for contraction development. Spasticity has long been associated with, uh, with contracture risk, but it's actually possibly quite overstated. Um, spasticity has been associated with significant structural changes in muscle, which can contribute to increased stiffness and reduce force generation properties, particularly changes in sarcomere length and numbers of sarcomeres in series.
and also associated with muscle fibrosis and stiffening of the extracellular matrix and connective tissue. Um, so yeah, in spastic muscles, you will see a reduction in muscle fascicle length, increased fascicular stiffness, reduced force generation capabilities, muscle atrophy and pination angles. But we'll come back to it because possibly overstated as a contributing factor. Immobilization has been strongly associated with muscle contracture development and is suspected to be the first cue to provoke structural muscle change contributing to muscle contracture. And that's irrespective of clinical diagnosis. So you'll see this pick up in the, the geriatrics research, in the intensive care research, any population who is less mobile. And it is really uh, quite strongly correlated with the length of immobilization and the degree of immobility or dependence. And you see the same sorts of myogenic changes in muscle after muscle uh, in muscle as you do in spasticity with reduction of number of sarcomeres in series, abnormal cross-linking, accumulation of fat and less extensible connective tissue within muscle and muscle atrophy. And immobilization also affects the biomechanical and um, sort of histological properties of muscle. So early on, you'll see reduced protein synthesis and muscle atrophy within six hours adaptive muscle shortening within 24 hours and increasing proportions of connective tissue within just a couple of days. So immobilization really, really early. And I alluded before that the length of time that someone's immobilized is also correlated with contracture development. Um, Clavitt in 2008 did a retrospective chart review of 155 patients in their ICU. And they found a really clear relationship that those who remained in ICU for eight weeks or more had a risk of contracture seven times more than those who stayed for three weeks. So increasing odds of contracture the longer you stay in the ICU. And that contractures were common in the ICU population with 68% of people being discharged from ICU with at least one severe contracture. And also really common in immobile older adults with incidences around 70% in nursing home residents. An illness severity is the fourth um, predictive factor I'd, I'd, I'd pose today. It sort of crosses over a little bit with immobilization and is related to ICU admission length and general poor health. Um, the use of neuromuscular blockade, so sedation and ventilation, where the muscle is getting no neuro, uh, you know, the muscle is getting no signals from a nerve, nothing is happening, the system is asleep for a period of time um, and correlated with the duration of ventilation. And then all the sarcopenia and muscle loss and muscle protein changes that occur when someone is that that poorly and that unwell. So if we can see in the literature that there's a clear link between these four factors and the, the generation or the evolution or progression of contractures, um, can they then be used inversely to potentially predict and prevent contracture? Um, or if we're too late for that, can we manipulate these factors to frame um, treatment plans or treatment focuses for contracture? So if we take them one by one, illness severity, as we've said, what can we do about it? It probably relates to immobilization, sedation and general complexity. When able, getting someone up early. I know that seems uh, easier said than done. If someone is uh, particularly sedated and ventilated for a, for a prolonged period and the evidence around greater than three weeks suggests it starts to go up dramatically, um, I think we have to start assuming that contractures are going to happen, particularly in key joints. Um, ankles are the ones we see the most of from the weights of beds. Um, and perhaps that's a place where we need to start consider prophylactic or preventative splinting for key joints. Close, close monitoring, perhaps try splint, see if you can get in there. Bed positioning is really important in the early days um, and it would be my personal plea for people to consider head and neck positioning as well. Uh, we see a lot of people with quite horrific cervical dystonias um, that I can't help but wonder are related to tracheal tug and spending lots of time in, in less than ideal supine positioning. And think about those other contributing factors that are probably lurking around in that person's body at that time. And can we optimize their general well-being? So autonomic dysreflexia, um, pain and nociceptive responses that trigger spasm and, and prolonged positioning, um, spasticity and spasm, bladder and bowel management. And uh, for our dietitian friends are usually all over this, but ensuring the person has proper nutrition for the muscles that are wasting away while they're sat there in that bed. <laughs> 
Uh, weakness has really usual and obvious strategies for other populations where we just strengthen. Um, it's really important to adhere to the strengthening literature here and make sure that we are strengthening with effective levels of load and repetition. Um, most strengthening done in, in physiotherapy sessions is probably suboptimal to load and repetition, considering eccentrics, concentrics, pilometrics, all of those functions of muscle. Um, but having said that, those things are all really difficult to influence in our population because strength has this really clear dose dependent response. So the person must have the capacity to strengthen, as in they must have the capacity to participate in a program of strengthening, which would be therapeutic. And to have one, one broad sweep at what an effective strengthening or functional use program looks like, the Queen's Square um, Upper Limb Program is a really good example, where they get fantastic results with their, with their patients, um, really incredibly significant changes in upper limb function through participation in a, a three-week program with 30 hours of therapy a week, six hours a day. So for the people that we serve, particularly here at the RHN and some of you out there in the world, there's a clear population and participation limitation to that as an intervention. So it might be useful to reframe it a little bit as well for our population and start to sort of apply scientific principles and, and invert the problem and suggest that muscle strength and function appears to be protective against contracture. If you're moving your limb, if you're doing things with, the, with your limb during day-to-day -day activities, uh, contracture doesn't have the opportunity to bed down. So if we presume that protective mechanism is active movement through range, we can then start to think that maybe weakness, poor function is that potential risk factor for progressive contracture. And it might be an indication in those patients to support regular joint and muscle positioning, monitoring, judicious use of splinting, 24 hour uh, positioning programs, those sorts of things. Spasticity is a really common thing that we see in our practice. I know we all do. Uh, depending on who you read, 50 to 75% of the stroke or ABI population um, will suffer some, some level of spasticity. Increasingly, we see in the literature that subclinical spasticity, so EMG detectable spasticity, is present really, really early. And if left unchecked, particularly, spasticity will be is, is clearly correlated with pain, increasing levels of disability, care burden and, and poor outcomes in the long term. And spasticity and immobility are excellent bedfellows. bedfellows. Um, they exacerbate each other and contribute to prolonged positioning. And that muscle being held in a shorter positioning, uh, in a shortened position through positioning, cues those myogenic changes in the muscle structure and biomechanics, which negatively influence the extensibility of muscle, changes to sarcomeres and muscle fiber length. And together they change spindle, muscle spindle irritability as the sense network of muscle. And ultimately that muscle and joint changes effects and adapts to those new positions. Effective treatment of these two sort of concurrent and co-occurring factors probably needs to be considered, I know it is for our, our patients and residents, um, as a lifelong cycle of intervention, of monitoring and intervention, because those risk factors that we've talked about, they never go away for this population, they're always there. So often our treatment is about managing the risk factors as much as the intervention. So as I said, spasticity's contribution to contraction may be overestimated. Several authors have looked at a sort of regression analysis to try and tease out what the contributing factors to contraction really are. And this is one example from Ada, where you can see that black is the contribution of spasticity to contraction. This crosshatch here is weakness. And in the first couple of months following stroke, the, the key contributing factor is, is spasticity. But as we go on, we see 39 weeks, a really significant component of um, weakness or, or strength loss contributing to that contracture. Uh, likewise, but go up here. Um, and so we can see that contractures are shown to develop before spasticity in some studies. Um, where the contracture has been observed before the evolution of spasticity and that that correlation between spasticity and contracture is relatively weak with a suggestion we should be considering alongside that more so the changes in intrinsic muscle and what we can do about their contribution to stiffness.
So prevention is always better than cure. And I know that that's easier said than done, particularly in the ICU environment. Um, but prevention includes preventing contracture, um, but also preventing progression. Um, those who come to you with contracture already, also make sure you consider their risks of that, that worsening, of, of that progressing. And the same uh, risk factors that we talked about earlier apply. And you have to implement these lifelong cycles of treatment. So as standard with our highly dependent, highly dependent people, 24-hour postural management programs and photo guidelines that are in place for every resident and patient, which makes sure that that person's joints are moved throughout the day, not in a passive ranging or muscle stretching framework, but in a into the chair, into the bed, sometimes the use of things like the motor med or other assisted devices to get more joint range of movement. And ensuring that posture and joints are supported in good positions and, you know, the appropriate wheelchair, the appropriate bed and sleeping system and the judicious use of splinting. And this should and must include the appropriate pharmacological um, treatment of pain, hyperesthesia, spasticity, spasm and triggers. And early botulinum toxin is coming out through the evidence is potentially the most efficacious method. So likewise with spasticity and immobility, the treatment looks a lot like the, the preventative strategies. Um, do reflect on what the potential triggers are for spasticity and make sure you have sorted those. So bladder and bowel, hyperesthesia, pain, um, pressure areas, anything that could be um, annoying the system. And your pharmacological treatment should also cover those, those same things. And then you have these sort of controversial topics of joint movement, stretch, uh, serial casting, splinting, and even surgery at times. Looking quickly at the evidence base for botulinum neurotoxin, the evidence of for early intervention is increasingly positive. And I know people are really tentative about this and there's, there's fears that we might um, remove function or delay recovery or uh, limit someone's potential from early intervention. Um, Lindsay in 2020, his PhD thesis, demonstrated that early treatment with low dose botulinum neurotoxin not only slowed contracture development, but it reduced the need for splints and those people showed no functional loss as they began to recover. So if we use low dose early toxin, it wears off quickly. We negate the need for splints, which we all know are um, never worn in, in the acute environments. It's really, really hard to get those splints on people, but for good reasons. They're not tolerated, they're in the way, there's a lot going on. Splints are a bit of a losing battle in several clinical environments. So early neurotoxin, again, headed that off and slowed contracture development. We know without a shadow of doubt that botulinum neurotoxin treatment will improve passive function, pain and impairment lasting 12 weeks. And we know that if we keep going and offer repeated cycles, which we'll talk about in a minute, we can have really, really good outcomes for these people. Within the evidence currently, the evidence for the for active function outcomes, so walking, doing things for yourself, is much poorer than the passive function literature. And it's quite sort of easy to explain. The, the research is only ever, you know, three months follow up. We don't see active function changes in our group that quickly. Um, and it's very, very hard to tease out and research whether the recovery of function related to toxin, um, the therapy that happened over or, or most likely the combination of the two and our sort of differing approaches across centers to, to goals and outcome measures, which, which speaks to our need to align our processes so that we can better show um, that we are being effective in active function goals for our patients. So this was ULIS 3 that came out in 2021 and they had oh a thousand 10,000 participants across 14 no Yes, 10,000 participants across 14 countries. Um, and they looked at the types of goals that were being set for these patients and how often they were being achieved. So you can see them cohorted by goals. Uh, the most common goals relate to pain, involuntary movement, range of motion, passive function, active function and mobility, with the most commonly set goal being passive function. And on the whole, across these, you know, a thousand odd, 10,000 odd people, um, there was really good goal achievement, averaging around 80 to 90 percent with the lowest goal achievement rate of 71 percent in active function. So most people who had treatment achieved the goals that were set, indicating high levels of effectiveness. 
And one of the questions that's often asked is how effective is this in the longer term? So the first graph here looks at um, goal attainment using the, the T-score. So if you achieve a 50, that means your goals were achieved as expected. So on the whole, all of those goals were achieved as expected, except for active function, which again, as we've talked about, is a little bit harder to evidence, a little bit harder to prove. But when we look across treatment across multiple cycles, so these are patients who came in um, and had up to seven cycles of treatment. But you can see that the number of patients in each cycle decreases. So the first cycle, 941 people had a really good and clinically important change from their treatment. And it looks a bit like there's a reducing rate of return. But although there is still clinically important changes here on the seventh cycle. But what's also happening is less people are coming back. So you could hypothesize that these guys here probably had the most complicated, complex clinical picture. And once you get to their seventh cycle, um, things are getting harder to sort out for them. Um, and also that it's really it's much easier on the first treatment to make a massive change. And then as you go through, you sort of start to have a, a slightly decreasing rate of return as things get more um, embedded and difficult to change. So when we look at the prolonged stretch literature, which is uh, prolonged stretch being anything splints um, or devices or thoses applied for longer than six hours to a limb to create prolonged stretch, uh, the literature is, is difficult to engage with. It's um, really heterogeneous. It doesn't apply itself to meta-analysis. There's not a lot of um, sort of robust RCTs and those sorts of things for us to pull on. But when you look across the literature, on serial casting specifically, you will see sort of a consensus trend that serial casting will increase joint range of motion, particularly in ankles. And the effects of that have been shown to last up to three months, which is the end point of the study. Um, you can also see a trend in the literature that if we try a little bit longer with serial casting as an intervention, people seem to get better outcomes than if we give up after a couple of cycles. Having said that, there's always um, people at the periphery of each experience, and they're the most important ones for us to understand as those who have uh, better or worse results. So those with severe brain injuries and the more immobile seem more likely to recover to recover range more slowly with, with serial casting interventions. And we see this in practice that their responses tend to be not so linear. You might do one cast, get a really good response, do one cast, get nothing, do one cast. It's sort of more like a relapsing, remitting kind of pattern um, with the suggestion really being with those guys that you have to keep, if safe to do so, keep trying for a little bit longer, two or three casts before you conclude that you're having no effect. One of the uh, most difficult aspects of serial casting is that the minute you take it off, you're likely to lose the range that you've gained. And the more dependent, the more vulnerable are the most likely population to suffer that withdrawal effect. They're also the most likely to suffer skin problems and skin breakdown within a cast. There's one study suggesting that if you add botulinum toxin uh, into the mix, you will reduce the rate of contracture progression and adverse event occurrence, but it is, it is just the Verplanck study. Um, and splints are contentious. Um, I think we could all actually conclude that splints don't increase range of motion and the evidence supports that statement. Clinically, though, sometimes that's exactly what we want. If we just want to hold a joint in a position and maintain it in the presence of risk factors that suggest that person will get a contracture. It's, just, it's a different question that we need to reframe when we look at the evidence. And then really recently, uh, Steve Ashford, Barbara Singer and Lynn Turner-Stokes released this paper just a couple of weeks ago where they looked at, uh, retrospectively, I think it was around 400 people who went through Northwick Park um, and cohorted by those who had no spasticity and contracture, spasticity, contracture, spasticity and contracture and looked across their outcomes. And in, in brief, those with spasticity and contracture had greater disability, added admission and discharge. They had a longer length. If you had spasticity and contraction, your length of stay was on average 30 days longer and cost about an extra £25,000. And it took a lot more therapy 
but they had similar overall functional gains and their treatment was cost effective with a reduction in estimated yearly care costs around 37 grand. So you would conclude from that that the, for, this, for this group to achieve equitable outcomes, they need access to, to longer hospital stays, but also a lot more sort of PT and OT input to get to the right place. But that treatment is still cost effective and we might need to argue for them a little bit differently. Uh, everyone worries about the risk of skin breakdown in serial casting. So just really briefly, it's it's common, zero to 50%, but also zero to 44% in splinting. There is a group of people who are far more likely to experience adverse events, and that, that creates a, a framework for, for risk assessment and mitigation. So those who are more vulnerable, more acutely brain injured and more likely to suffer those problems. And that can also be managed through shorter casting interval uh, of less than four days, which where the poll study pulled that apart and found less things went wrong if you didn't leave it on for too long. There are still a number of gaps in the prolonged stretch and serial casting evidence that we need to be, be well aware of. Um, there are some people who respond differently and we don't understand who they are or how we can predict when this will manifest towards no effect or harm in those individuals. So slow responders, non-responders, it's really hard to understand the long-term efficacy of these of these interventions, both splinting and serial casting, in a population who don't and will not move again. And biarticular muscles, there's a suggestion that biarticular muscles, like the gastrocnemius and hamstring, respond differently. And we need to probably think about improve, including two joint muscle stretch within our treatment programs. And we need to think about each joint individually within our research questions to come out with some more useful outcomes. And really important that we measure things. Really, really important. Otherwise, we can't prove that what we're doing is effective or pointless. Um, so we need to include measurements of treatment, but also general physical stability, because we have to balance out those decisions of whether it is proportionate to intervene or not. That frequency of measurement is up to you. It needs to be individually assessed according to the risk of deterioration or change or, you know, the risk of missing positive change as well. So we tend to, we use outcome measures at levels of impairment, activity and participation, which include the list there, but not exclusive to. Clinical photography is incredibly useful with this population. Very easy way to share information between services or between clinicians in times of staffing change. The arm A and the leg A, we use a lot. Every patient has those as part of their, um, their battery of sort of regular outcome measures and review. And obviously the Northwick Park and gas feature as well. The Ligger and the Armour, uh, available on the KCR website, you can see there, they're, they're really useful patient and carer reported tools. Very simple, they're just a series of um, like, Likert scores that you just score as to how difficult it is to provide or give care for something. And they're recommended in the RCP 2018 spasticity guidance as part of that sort of focal spasticity and measure. It's important to point out they have separate active and passive subscales. They're independently valid. So you'd never total the scores. And if your patient has no active function, like most of mine, you can just use the passive function scale, but yeah, do not combine the scores. Uh, the psychometrics for the armor are known uh, and a minimally clinically in, uh, important difference on the armor is 2.5 on the passive subscale and 1.5 on the active subscale. So in conclusion, um, these people have really, really complex problems, but there's some commonality within their condition that if we sit back, we can seize on in order to better predict and prevent in the ideal world, but also manipulate to provide treatment. If we do nothing, those, those factors amalgamate and turn into worsening disability, pain, impairment, soft tissue injuries, skin problems, all of those things that we see all the time. And there's increasing suggestion that treatment is cost effective in the long term, but can be labor intensive for periods, you know, sort of bursts of activity as well over their lifespan. But if rather than waiting for it to happen, if we assume physical deterioration will occur, there's some relatively straightforward things we can do in our physical management to prevent that. 
and that contracture and postural deformity appear quite clearly associated with several causative factors. So that's our weakness, immobility, spasticity and illness severity, which we can manipulate to predict and prevent or manipulate as treatment focuses. And just a last reminder that all treatment, all prevention must remain within best interests, be proportionate um, and, and, and use least restrictive means, bearing in mind that particularly serial casting is, is a relatively restrictive um, intervention.